Hi, welcome to the Productive AI Podcast, where we aim to simplify AI and make it more accessible to business leaders. I'm your host, Troy Angredon. On today's episode, we're talking with Mark Kramer, an entrepreneur and product leader, on why traditional product management is not enough when you're building an AI-specific product and what you should do about it. A little bit of background on Mark before we get into this. He started as an engineer and worked his way through product management, business development, and eventually became an advisor, CEO, founder, CEO, and ultimately started working in the angel investing and startup advisory and mentor services, as well as being a public speaker, and ultimately landed uh, some leadership product management roles in some AI-specific product companies. And so I wanted to have him on today because he's got this extensive background in working with startups and in productizing across multiple industries, and then also also in working in product management for AI specifically. And he has some really interesting things to say about why product management itself is a maybe very not well understood discipline, but then how to apply that into the artificial intelligence space. So I want to just start with your background, uh, Mark, because you've kind of come, you know, from the engineer land all the way up through the leadership, and then eventually into the sort of the mentoring, which I think is a natural arc for a lot of a lot of folks. Now you've come full circle, and you're a student again at Stanford. So could you just kind of walk us through that arc in the context of the conversation we're going to have today? Uh, my pleasure, and and thank you, Troy. That was a, a very kind and flattering introduction. So I began my career as an engineer. I have a degree in electrical engineering and, and straight out of college, I did engineering things. Um, I worked at Compaq Computers. I was essentially doing debugging on the, the motherboard system level debugging. Uh, but then I went to business school and then after business school, I started doing businessy type things. So there was some project management, there was some business development in there. Uh, I was attracted to, to business development for a number of different reasons. But I think over the arc of my career, as you kind of described, I have kind of slowly made my way back towards the tech side of things. Uh, not to the point where I'm an engineer, of course, uh, but uh, I feel like I've gravitated. I, I have a natural affinity for technology. And so I've gravitated into a position which I think is the most comfortable for me, which is product management. And it's... Uh, because it's the, the combination of things, both technical and, and business. And, I, and we're going to get into talking about what product management is uh, very shortly. Uh, as far as the, as the studies go, the Stanford thing is, at least to me, it's somewhat, somewhat amusing. So when I was uh, running my small startup, which developed an algorithm to improve the relevance of search results, I rediscovered my love for algorithms. Uh, after I moved on from that, and I took a position at, at, at PARC, which is the Palo Alto Research Center, uh, part of Xerox, to work on product management for some of their AI technologies. Um, I was looking out my window of my office, and I could see Hoover Tower. And so I said to myself, hey, maybe I'll go take a course over there. Uh, one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was in the uh, program for the Graduate Certificate in AI, which is essentially it's a 16-unit uh, program uh, taking master's classes in, with the Stanford. So um, I'm not getting a degree from there. I'm getting a certificate, so I just want to clarify that uh, small thing. But it has been – it's amazing. It is, it is exhilarating to get back into the classroom and to study this stuff. Because frankly, I, I find AI to be mesmerizing. Awesome. And I loved one of your posts when you were talking about going back and doing this this whole, you know, taking on this very large amount of work and going through this program at Stanford. And I think your your final summary sentence was because learning is super cool or something like that, which I really loved. I really appreciated that. I, I love learning. I think we should all strive to be lifelong learners. Uh, technology moves quickly. Uh, nobody wants to become obsolete. Uh, I personally like being at sort of the the tip of the spear or out in front of the wave or whatever analogy you want to use. I can't think of a better uh, metaphor right now, but I'm sure there is one. It, it was exhausting. So I'm, I'm three fourths of the way through. I got one class left. So I'll wrap that up next year. Fantastic. Yeah. That's pretty great. 
so let's dive into the, the core of today's talk. And you've been kind of promoting or pitching, I would say, this kind of core idea that AI product management is more than just product management, that it requires additional tools or techniques beyond traditional product management. And product management itself is not very well defined in many people's minds. So can you walk us through, maybe start with what is product management, and then what is AI, and then we'll sort of get into, okay, how do you put the two together? Yeah, sure. I think starting with what is product management is the most logical place to start. And whenever I give talks about this this topic, you know, product management, I always start with let's let's define what what product management is. Uh, a couple of months ago, I ran across a a post on Twitter. It was by a uh, I've got it here a, a woman named Bo Lao. Uh, she wrote, "If someone held a gun to my head and asked me what product managers do." Tell my family I love them. So I like that quote, or I like that tweet, because first of all, it is it is funny, but uh, secondly, uh, the reaction that it that it received was incredible. So nine thousand people clicked the the like heart, a uh, thousand retweets, two hundred comments, and reading through the reaction to that post, it was just very clear that many people, even people who work in tech just don't have a real good grip on what a product manager is or what a product manager does. And the opinions kind of are all over the board. Now, I have my own take on it, which I actually share with Marty Kagan, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I think it's worth first pointing out that you know the role changes significantly depending on the company. Uh, it's even sometimes not even called product manager, sometimes program management. Uh, it's different from project management. It's unfortunate that project and product sounds so, they share so many letters, but project management is a different thing, product management. So what is it? Let me start with maybe a couple things that people, ways that people describe it, which I consider to be on sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. So the first is the CEO of the product or the mini CEO, right? Some people describe the product manager, you're the, you're the CEO of your product, right? And I take exception to this, and many people take exception to my exception, by the way, uh, which is perfectly fine. And I, I think that this analogy breaks down because uh, product managers don't have hiring and firing authority over the people with whom they work. And now someone will naturally retort and say, wait, you know, you have to, you, okay, you don't have a direct line authority to the, to the people on the product, but you need to use your persuasive talents in your, you need to, uh, uh, you know, collaborate with people and kind of persuade them in the directions that you need to go and that kind of thing and use your, you know, your interpersonal skills in this kind of thing. And that is true. And that's also true if you're a CEO, by the way, right? Uh, however, my retort to the retort is it's still not the same if the people are not reporting to you. It's just not the same relationship. So at the other end of the spectrum, we have a, a, a number of folks, uh, quite a large number of folks who actually think their product managers don't do anything. And they're, they're useless. Uh, and so uh, there are articles about how product managers have the highest bus factor. And I'm not sure if everyone's aware of what the bus factor is. It's, no. it's a morbid metric to measure the level of impact on an organization if someone gets hit by the bus. Got it. Right? And so there's a, a very funny comic, uh, it's not funny, I mean morbidly funny, of <laughs> a, a truck that just ran over a product manager and the two of the coworkers are standing by and they see this and one says to the other, well, at least it wasn't the intern. Obviously, I take great exception to this characterization of the role of a product manager, but many, many people feel that way. And I guess, depending on the organization that you're in, certainly some product managers are more empowered than others. And if you're in an organization where their product managers are not empowered and uh, Marty Kagan, who I'll talk about shortly is a, you know, describes something called a feature team. And if you're on a feature team, you're actually more of a project manager than a product manager. And so, yeah, okay, maybe there's something to be said for that. Anyway, all that being said, I personally feel that the most useful, and by the way, apologies for the long-winded windup here, <laughs> uh, the most useful characterization of the product manager is uh, someone who performs two tasks. And this is uh, what Marty Kagan describes in his book, Inspired, 
of which the second version is out. I, anyone who's interested in becoming a product manager or understanding what product managers do, it's, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, and he basically says that product managers do two things, assess the opportunity and define the product. <laughs> and so what do each of those mean? So assessing the opportunity means uh, going out into the marketplace and talking with potential customers and prospects and people who might buy your product. Uh, Steve Blank, who is another person who I think everybody should follow, um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of his, talks about how you don't learn anything inside the building. Get out of the building. So go talk to people, right? So talk to, talk to customers, uh, analyze the competition, uh, look at the competitive strengths and weaknesses, understand the technology that's at your uh, that, that's available to you that you could bring to bear in the marketplace and essentially try to figure out, is there an opportunity for a product somewhere and what is that opportunity and how big is that opportunity? So that's part A. And then part B is once that's done, somebody needs to build this and somebody needs to define what's going to be built. And so uh, if you're using software, you're, you're naturally going to be, if you're building software, you're naturally going to be using me agile methodologies, but a product needs to be defined. Somebody needs to and a product manager will do that. They'll say, here are the features that we need. You know, here are the ones that we must have. Here are the ones that maybe would be great to have. And here are the ones that we could have and, and prioritize what needs to be built and put together a roadmap of how you're going to get to get that product into the market and how you're going to take market share, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, another way of looking at it is the liaison between uh, the, mar the customer and the, the enterprise. Some people describe the product manager as the voice of the customer. I think it's a little more than that, but yeah, it's it's, it's someone who's just going to try to fill that gap. I'm glad you brought up Steve Blank. I was having a great conversation with Alistair Crowley the other day, and Alistair and I go way back, and he wrote the book Lean Analytics, which is strongly patterned on the lean startup uh, methodology, which of course Steve Blank and Randy Commissar, uh, <clears throat> you know, sort of originally came up with, and then it was popularized through Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup. And so Alistair and his team, they wrote Lean Analytics to talk about if you're a startup, you can't use traditional enterprise kind of growth analytics. You have to use startup analytics or startup metrics. That's a bit of a side note. But in the course of that conversation, we were talking about, well, what is a product? You know, what is the CEO's job? And, you know, and certainly I think Blank and Commissar and Reese would probably agree with this. It's, it's finding the sustainable business model. You know, what products can we right. sell to how many customers and how, you know, how many markets for what price and can we make a profit? separate from, as you said, that's the CEO's job, separate from the product manager's job as you're describing it. And one of the great quotes I loved was product development is really having a bunch of conversations. And I think it's back to the get out of the building and talk to customers and be empathetic and hear their problems. What do you think about that? I think, I think in startups, and by the way, I, uh, one of Steve Blank's uh, I, many claim to f claims to fame is his characterization of the startup as a temporary organization in search of a scalable, repeatable business model. Exactly. Which I think is- Which I love. A f is a fantastic way to look at it. Um, and uh, I would say that in small organizations, the CEO is often the product manager. So in in- in initial startups. And in that case, when I was talking about the CEO is, or the product manager is CEO, well, in this case, the product is actually the CEO. And so in that case, you do have hiring and firing authority over the people who report directly to you. So that is the one right. case where the product well, manager- but the, but Yeah. And those are two hats, right? I mean, if one person yes. has to wear the two hats, <laughs> sure. But the two hats are separate hats. But you, exactly. And when you're, in a, when you're in a small company and you're the CEO, you should be out in the field talking to people. So I, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure at what headcount you might want to start, the CEO might want to start passing some of those responsibilities onto a specifically a, a product manager, a VP of product, or maybe a CPO, mm -hmm. but uh, there's, there's going to be a transition there. Uh, so when I was the CEO of the startup that I ran, I performed product management I, I think I would consider the majority of my responsibility to be product management. But in addition to that, I also did all sorts of other things like hiring and accounting and fundraising and, and marketing and, and kind of pretty much everything, uh, at least initially, everything beyond development.
Okay, great. Well, let's move into the next part of this then. So I think we've got a pretty clear idea of what product management isn't and that there's kind of a spectrum uh, from the, if they get hit by a bus, we don't really care to they're the CEO of the product. And it sounds like you don't agree with either end of that spectrum. And you really base it on this, this idea of uh, assess the opportunity and define the product. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's a really nice, clear way for people to go, oh, okay, if they're doing those two things, that, that's probably the product manager. Let's talk about AI and because the purpose of this podcast is to be educational for people who are not necessarily in this space and don't understand all the acronyms and the terminology and the jargon, how would you simply explain artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and data science? And, and are those things related or unrelated at a very high level? Just what's your simple view of that world? All the things that you talked about are related and I've seen them the relationship between AI, machine learning, uh, and deep learning uh, described in many different ways. But one of the ones, one of the ways that works the best for, for me is that deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And over time, there's been an evolution from AI over to deep learning. So the history uh, is that uh, AI, if you think of AI as a any kind of software uh, that, or uh, you know, any kind of program that's going to vaguely try to imitate a human characteristics or decision making, then you can look back to you know the 1950s, 60s, 70s when people were developing what was called uh, expert systems. And these are rule-based systems. I consider expert systems to be artificial intelligence. Uh, so do the folks at Stanford for that matter, because uh, I took a survey class in AI and they discussed this. And, and the general idea is, is relatively simple. You just, you can think of a flow chart. Uh, uh, you have a, a, an agent who's in some kind of environment <clears throat> and the agent will observe the environment and then make some decisions which are hard programmed into the into the, the expert system. Like if you want to navigate a maze, if there's a wall in front of you, the decisions might be turn left or turn right and you can choose one of those and if it's open, then you go forward, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> so this starts breaking down as systems become more complex because just the, the creation and maintenance and debugging of these rules just quickly becomes unwieldy. Like imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, AlphaGo be written by an expert system. AlphaGo being the, the deep learning system that uh, plays the board game Go. Uh, virtually impossible. So sometime, uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I'm gonna get my dates right here, but 80s, 90s uh, ish, uh, machine learning uh, became more prevalent. And, and here, what we're doing is we're developing algorithms that, that figure out the rules on their own. What you do is you have an engineer who's going to do what's called feature engineering. And the engineer will look at the environment and figure out what features are important and will extract those features from the, from the environment. And they'll be fed into some sort of a machine learning algorithm, which will produce a, a prediction right, or, or a classification or whatever it is that you want to do, right? And these, of course, become very powerful because you can extract a number of features and then all of the complex rules will be handled by, you know, any number of different machine learning algorithms. And that was great. So recently, and I would say in the past <clears throat> 10, 20 years, but certainly in the last 10 years, uh, people have gotten very excited about artificial intelligence and there's been a tremendous amount of hype around all the different things that it can do, all the magical things that it can do, which frankly, hype, okay, so hype is not necessarily, I, I personally think a lot of that hype is merited because it, AI is doing some crazy things these days. Uh, but the, the evolution from machine learning to deep learning has been that rather than having the human being extract the features from the environment, you let the network do it. So the so the algorithm is going to do two things. The algorithm is going to extract the features from the environment and then figure out the rules to achieve whatever it is you want the system to achieve. And so this all of a sudden becomes just uh, uh, it's a quantum leap in 
uh, capabilities and performance because now you unlock all kinds of things like speech recognition and and uh, computer vision and AlphaGo, of course, is uh, is a, is another example of of deep learning. And when you're no longer reliant upon the human to do the feature engineering, you can build some very big models that do it for you, and they just produce astounding results. One of the things when I came into the field, I was a little baffled by until I actually went to a developer AI developer camp. We're sitting there, they're walking us through this concept of feature extraction. And I have another point I'll get to in a second here. But ultimately, you know, they showed us how it worked and then we opened some spreadsheets and we massaged some data and basically said, okay, let's move these columns around and mark these ones as important and these ones are not important and change the format. Maybe male, female goes to a male equals one, you know, versus zero. Yep. Things like that. And I and I said to them, I said, wait a minute, this is really just data cleansing. This is what we've been doing for 20 or 30 years in spreadsheets. Why do you, why do you call it feature extraction? They said, because that's the word we use in AI. And I said, okay, that's a bit circular in, in terms of your answer. You know, it sounds, it's really just fancy data cleanup at the end of the day, is it not? Uh, sure. Uh, well, um, I think there's a, there's a subtle distinction between, so okay. certainly a lot of the terminology has worked its way backwards in time, right? People attribute things that they're doing today and they map that terminology on systems that were built decades ago. So if you want to know the distinction between feature extraction and data cleanup, uh, let me perhaps pro provide an example. So one way that people often will demonstrate the, the power of machine learning is by doing by uh, predicting the value of houses, right? So sure. given a given a home, can can you estimate the the price of of this home? Right. And uh, Zillow does that. This, they're called Zestimates. You can go to it right. and it's, this is, okay. So, Which seems magical. I mean, you go there and you put in any address and it says that this is, yep. it's worth, worth this much. And you think, why didn't they have to send somebody out there to figure that out? Exactly. It so, does seem magical. It, and it is. Um, so the feature extraction is the thing that a, an engineer will do to figure out what are the attributes of the house, which are important in estimating the price of the house. For example, the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the number of floors. Uh, this could be a, a tough process. I mean, we're just talking about pricing homes, right? Sure. Uh, and, and already we're, you know, but if you were to collect data on all the homes in the country or in a certain area, and you had columns of all these different things, then you could essentially try to figure out which columns are important and which columns are not important. Uh, you know, when was the last time the kitchen was renovated? You know, uh, what color are the cabinets? You know, it can go on and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. And now some of these So it's features, really figuring out which variables are critical variables in order to interpret the correct output. Right. Well, it's, it's trying to figure out which variables have any sort of predictive value on the price. And then the machine learning is going Got to try to figure out which ones are, are important. And it's going to figure out which ones are more important than others. It's also going to figure out which variables interact with each other. If they're present, you know, together, or one is present and the other's not, what impact does that have on the valuation? If you have a pool, that should increase the value. If it's Alaska, maybe not so much. I mean, just as a random example, right? right? So anyway, so that's feature extraction. And and this can be this can be very this can can start to become very difficult. And one example that I like to give is so imagine if you are a developer and your job is to given a photograph, output whether it's a picture of a cat or not, or whether it's a picture of a dog or not. So if you're using machine learning, you need to come up with some features. I don't even know where you'd start. Fur, uh, eyes, nose. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could okay. start to describe a, a variety of different traits and look for them, I suppose, using the computer vision. And how would you distinguish between a dog and a cat? <laughs> yeah, I'd ask I, a three-year-old. Yeah, well, any three-year-old. I, I don't know if I could, could go point. from there to programming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> any three-year-old could point at a picture and say, that's a dog, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's totally. a cat. Totally, right? yeah. Talk, very easy. But if you wanted to figure out what are the features, so I did some research research into this. Um, and, uh, you know, apparently, okay, first of all, they sound different, 
but it's a picture, so you don't have sound. Sure. Yeah. Also, the muzzles might be different, but you know, there's some dogs with flat muzzles, some cats with long muzzles. Mm -hmm. uh, the claws are different, but you don't necessarily always see the claws. The sizes are different. You can't tell that from the picture. Anyway, it, it becomes a fantastically challenging problem, and deep learning solves this. But I wanted to get back to the data cleanup. Sure. To just quickly talk about that. So in uh, so I talked about feature extraction. Data cleanup is more along the lines of uh, we have missing data or messy data or dirty data. So imagine we have our spreadsheet of all these houses and 10% of them uh, don't ha have a blank for the number of bedrooms. Right. You just have what, missing what data. Doing? I mean, anybody yeah. who's done data cleanup like me yep. or you in our history, we'd say, well, that's that's the state of the world. Of course you don't have sure. all the cells. Of course you don't have all that data. So, so that's the distinction you would draw is yes. one is do? backfilling and fixing the data versus identifying which <laughs> of those data fields are critical hmm. to correct yeah. output of prediction. And data cleanup, like, there are lots of techniques. There's a number of things you can do. Uh, you could ignore the row. You could say, okay, if the house doesn't have the data for the number of bedrooms, we could just not I'll use it. it. Sure. it. That's one way. Yeah. Uh, you could come up with an algorithm to try to estimate it. So for example, how many bedrooms are in the house? The house is next door. Mm -hmm. and if you're in the same square footage. Right. Or the same square footage. If you looked in the neighborhood and every house had with the same square footage has three bedrooms, that's a good guess. So this basically you're going to try to populate the missing data. Um, there are other techniques. There's lots of okay. different things that you can do. But Got yeah, it. I mean, that's... I think that's a great distinction just to, just yeah. to clearly help people understand that, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly for me, that feature extraction is a separate discipline from just cleaning the data. And those are both required. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Now, how do we, let's get into the sort of the crux of this. Now, your, your kind of position that you've been making and you've been giving talks on this, you've got slide decks on this that are out on the, the internet, which is essentially that AI product management it requires something above and beyond traditional product <coughs> management. So the first question I have is why? Why is it so different? And wouldn't you say that about absolutely any kind of product management? So toy product management or widget product management, aren't they also separate disciplines and don't they require something above and beyond? Why is this special? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a decent argument, and I would say that if you're a product manager, it is incumbent upon you to understand the details of whatever field you happen to be in and whatever products or marketplace you happen to be playing in. So, if you are a product manager for a toy company, then you should know toys. So that would be <laughs> that would be helpful, right? Minimum buy-in. You should yes, know your domain. You should, you should understand what the toys are. Uh, play with the toys. Uh, buy some toys, uh, talk to people who buy toys, right? All that's, all that's table stakes, right? Sure. Um, I think that, that AI, the reason why uh, I've gone through the effort to kind of break that out distinct from maybe technology in general or software in general is I think there's a few characteristics about it, which maybe because of its newness, uh, maybe because of the hype around it, uh, maybe because of the technology around it, I think requires a somewhat expanded tool set for the product manager to be able to successfully navigate product managing uh, anything that's either built on AI or has AI components or is built around AI. So, uh, and I think the first thing, if you wanna just get right into it, is understanding the technology. And I think AI is, is different from other types of technologies simply because of its, the complexity of its nature and the difficulty of grasping how it works, what it does, what it can do, juxtaposed with everyone else's sort of understanding of, of what it could possibly do or how it works or what it can do. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, we talked a little about, about the algorithmic nature of uh, AI and comparing deep learning, machine learning. And, and so that at a very high level, you can have a sense of generally what it can be done, what, what AI can accomplish. Uh, I often refer to it as just you're mapping inputs to outputs. It's I, Sometimes I suggest AI is glorified pattern matching. And if you are an executive 
uh, you know, maybe this is sufficient, a sufficient level of understanding uh, in order for you to execute, you know, your function. But I, I really believe that as a product manager, it will behoove you to really understand how this AI works in order to do two things. One is to communicate with your your engineering team, right? To get some senses to what, what is possible, what's not possible, uh, how difficult it is to achieve certain, certain things. And communications between product management and, and, and engineering is, is, is absolutely critical. And so you have to be able to speak the language. You have to understand what people are saying to you. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, going out into the marketplace and assessing opportunities, if you don't have this uh, very solid foundation of understanding what it is, you know, what are the capabilities of the, of the technology that you're looking to build, it's just going to make the job that much more difficult. And, and you could end up going down paths where, you know, you, you, you don't have a happy outcome at the other end. So, right. so that's my, that's my thought on that. I, I, I could go just a little bit further. Um, so I talked earlier about, uh, taking these classes at, at Stanford, uh, I often like that, uh, I believe, is overkill for the vast majority of- I was just going to ask you kind of yeah. the scale and the depth on the on this educational journey for, let's say, the executive team versus the product manager versus maybe an engineering leader, right? Those are different yeah. types of education and different depths of, of education. So the stuff that uh, the, the courses that I'm pursuing at Stanford, this is the type of stuff that anyone in engineering or an engineering leader that that these these folks should know, right? Uh, I I believe that it is overkill for a product manager. I'm doing it because I love it and I think it's awesome and it's fun and I'm enjoying it. And I guess there's no harm in knowing more than you need to know, right? Uh, and I think there are certainly some product management roles where having this kind of uh, you know, detailed understanding of the the algorithmic principles of the AI is is helpful, but in most cases, no. So I would say, uh, for the vast majority of product managers who want to do things with AI or in AI, you can take it down a notch. And I have a an article on uh, LinkedIn where I talk about all the different things that you could do if you wanted to bone up on the technology. And there are tons of resources. And they're accessible to everybody. Uh, they range from the not so hard to the harder to the hardest. Uh, you can definitely find something in there that works for you. Uh, I try to give like motivation to people who want to go down this path by letting them know that you can do it. You can do it. If you don't know how to program in Python, you can take an online course and learn how to program in Python. Step one. And then go take a class that uh, uh, I started with the... Uh, Udacity AI nano degree. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Uh, yep. It's a little pricey, but sure. Um, but if you don't want to, uh, I think it's like, I'm actually not sure how much it is. 700, 800 bucks, something like that. I was in the very first cohort and I got in for like $300 or something like that. <laughs> Perfect. And, um, and then it started from there. And then, you know, there's, there are many, look, if you do, if you just do a search on, you know, how can I learn AI? But I would say that if you want, to really do it with any level of seriousness, I do advocate that product managers get in there and actually write some code, build some models. Don't You don't need to be an engineer, uh, but you should do some fundamentals, right? To get a sense of, of what's happening. Build a linear regression model. Uh, uh, you can do it in Excel, right? But I would encourage you to do it in Python or, or R or Octave or MATLAB or whatever you want to do. Uh, find some course, follow it. Uh, the Coursera courses are great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give Fantastic. props to it. Andrew Ng has a, has a machine learning course out there. Uh, yeah. th it's accessible. He explains things beautifully. And I think that uh, I believe that with, with some effort, anyone could do it. So let's switch over to kind of the value prop. You and I talked about the value proposition, or rather the, 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 two, the two tensions in being an AI product manager. Um, can you talk through those for a sec? Yeah, I think you're referring to essentially when you're communicating the value proposition, how you have to be both the pragmatist and the evangelist, which is, 
which is not completely dissimilar from being a startup CEO. And it's actually, which is not dissimilar from a lot of leadership roles, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take, tug of war, whatever metaphor you want to use. But you have to, on the one hand, I mean, you have to be rah-rah and say, great, we can do this, charge that hill, let's build it, let's go. Um, while simultaneously uh, be remaining tethered to reality of, of what can actually be produced on what timeline, with what budget, uh, with what accuracy or performance. Uh, and so... This is a, you know, this is a, a tightrope, which I think um, always needs to be uh, walked. But when it comes to AI, I think it becomes a little extra charged. And the, I think the problem is that because people are so enthusiastic about uh, that, enthusiastic about it, and rightly so, that when you know, uh, when, when, as a product manager, when you're communicating with your stakeholders, which could be your, your customers, by the way. When when you when you're talking with your your customers, your your prospects or your betas or whomever, uh, and you're talking about how you know the system is using AI to do blah blah blah, you know, they'll say, oh AI, I've you know I saw that on the news, uh, and or so Home and Garden, or I read <laughs> I read about that in Home and Garden. Uh, isn't it going to do everything for me? It's going to it's going to take away my job or it's going to take over or it's going to work automatically or, you know, it's, uh, it's going to send a robot into the past or whatever, you know? So, uh, you know, people come with lots of preconceived notions about, yeah. about it. And so in your toolkit, uh, as an AI product manager, I think one of the things you need is some strategies for unwinding all of that, Right. And or or setting expectations properly while still maintaining enthusiasm for the product, right? So and so that's a hard thing to do uh, yeah, because sure. nobody nobody wants to be Debbie Downer. It's your role to kind of you know right. set everyone straight. And I think one of the te- one of the techniques that I think works well uh, for achieving this is um, is talking about the things that the AI is not going to do. Right, and, and often that can be a very subtle way of communicating to folks that the AI is not going to do this and the AI is not going to do that. So as a quick example, let's say you have a, an app and uh, it's going to, uh, you're going to take a picture of a bird uh, and it's going to tell you what, the, what kind of bird that is. Uh, people will naturally say, oh, it's using AI. So boom, it's going to get it 100% of the time, right? I was, right. I'm going to take a picture. I was going to have a, okay. If you also communicate to your stakeholders that, hey, here's a button that if you click it, you can manually put in what the bird is, or you can uh, adjust what the app re- you know tells you what the bird is, or adjust what the AI tells you, then this is a very subtle way of saying, well, the AI is not going to be 100%, is it? Otherwise, right. why would we have this button? We wouldn't need yeah. this button, right? Right. So uh, I think that's a technique that often works. Whenever, whatever features you have in your application where the human is doing work, then this is an implicit signal to all your stakeholders that, in fact, the AI is not going to do that. Right. Or the AI will do it, but maybe not perfectly. Yes, I think Tesla is a great example. Uh, Tesla uses AI to drive the vehicle. Uh, it still has a steering wheel. That being said, there are still people who literally fall asleep behind the wheel. Uh, okay, so let's go. There's one other thing I wanted to get to in the AI product management. Actually, two. So you and I talked about kind of two other additional kind of responsibilities here. One was just deliver the MVP. I think you could probably expand on that. Mm. And I think that to me, kind of the big, big one and the one I've been having conversations with other product folks about is don't forget all the stuff around the AI. The AI might be the the kernel in the center that's 20% delivering 80% of the value, but what about the rest of the product that you're building, which is the customer interface or any and all of the other things, the integration points with other systems that are not AI. So maybe if you could just talk through those those points, what your thoughts are in there. Yeah, we were just discussing non-AI features just in, in the communication aspect of, you know, when you're communicating the value proposition of your product, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I try to make it a point to remember that while may, even if your application has an AI core, uh, as a product manager, 
it is incumbent to make sure that all the things that go around it are still there. At least, you know, the important things like if you forget your password, is there, is there, is there a way to recover it? Right. Right. So, uh, that's can not you AI. sign up for the product? Can you sign yes? Uh, where, can you, you know, pay? <laughs> if I upload my profile pic and I decide that I don't like it, can I change it? Uh, yeah, right. For this sure. seems like trivial, right? But you know, depending on the the breadth and the scope of your application, if right. you know, it's it, you you can't forget about these things. You can't forget about just the the the, the nuts and bolts or the piping or all the other things that kind of go around whatever it is that you're doing, right? So um, for the ornithology application, um, can, uh, you know, can, uh, can it upload those pictures to the cloud? Right. Uh, you know, uh, it, they're no good if they're stuck in the app, right? Can you share them? You know, uh, I, I don't know, if, uh, you know, what, what features are going to be the most critical and what features maybe like, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Moscow method, which is a, a technique in product management where you prioritize features as must have, should have, could have, won't have. And if you torture those enough, you can come up with a, an acronym of Moscow, must, must, you know, should have, could have, won't have. Anyway, um, and, uh, you know, so what features are the must haves, which, which are the, the should haves, the could haves, and which are things are you're not, you're not going to do. Right. Uh, you, you'll still have to think about those. Obviously, they're important. Uh, but you just can't, you can't obsess and or overly focus on just the, whatever the machine learning aspects are of your application. So yeah. I have a, an opinion, which people can share or disagree with that the hardest thing for any product manager is defining the MVP. And for people who are not aware of what that is, that's the minimally viable product. And the idea is uh, with the lean startup, as you were, you know, you were talking about earlier, <clears throat> is to define a product that has a minimally viable functionality such that you can get it into the marketplace and start iterating. Uh, it's the most stripped down version of your product that you could possibly think of. And the reason is that uh, once the product is into the marketplace, whether and even if it's a, a private beta, right? But once it's in the hand of customers, the rate at which you get feedback with respect to your product and the functionality expands, you know, exponentially, right? So, right. And if you're an agile shop, which if you're developing shop software, you of course are, uh, then you can immediately exploit this feedback to change the direction or improve the direction of the product and and navigate through the, you know, whatever it is, right? right. Okay, so. So how does um, that relate in an AI context? Because, I mean, this has been written about and argued about and debated. And, of course, people talk about what is an MVP, how small, how big, is it a web page, is it a product, et cetera. Right. That's, that we're not going to get into that whole morass here. But, uh, you know, if you don't know, we'll put all this stuff in the show notes and then you can go right. read this stuff because it's super important if you're <laughs> building product. So aside from that, um, you know, getting getting past the the basics of the MVP debates, how is that – uh, different in this context. Yes. And I think it's, it's different in an important way. And, um, so I'll mention, so we we're talking about Tesla earlier. And so I'm going to mention, um, Andre Karpathy, mm -hmm. uh, who is one of the lead engineers over there. I'm actually mm -hmm. not exactly sure what his title is these days. I think but, it might uh, be lead AI engineer, but I don't could, know. Yes. That, so. Okay. So you're familiar with him. Um, he talks about something called software 2.0, uh, which I saw him uh, present at a conference in uh, 2018, and I thought it was very compelling. And essentially what he was describing was how in software 1.0, you, or one, I could say, not necessarily, but a, a, a human or a group of humans could define the functionality of a piece of software, and the development team could then build that functionality and it would map directly to whatever point you defined in the space of all software, right? And so essentially it was uh, deterministic, right? So think of any app that doesn't have uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, if you, yeah, uh, you know, it does exactly what it's supposed to do, right? And there's, mm -hmm. there's no deviation from that. Like a messaging app, right? If I send you a text right. message, you get that message. Right. Right. 
I, and, and, and it's I, kind of a straight line from what is the intention, what is my definition, what is the product, it does that thing that I defined. That is exactly correct. Right. right. So it does what you tell it to do, right? Yeah. Which you tell the computer to do a thing, the computer does that thing. Now, mm -hmm. you may make a mistake in what you tell the computer to do, but it will do exactly what you tell it to do. And then you can right. fix the mistake. Later. Okay. Software 2.0 is what Karpathy was talking about, is when essentially now in the program space, you are defining a system that is going to learn over time. And so the behavior of that system is, in fact, moving. It's a moving right. target, right? So it's right. going to change. And I think as a, as a product manager, it becomes increasingly difficult to define the product or the MVP because the software is no longer deterministic, right? right. So now instead, what you need to do is, as a product manager, you need to maybe put some thresholds or some boundaries, like the software needs to do this a certain percentage of the time, or the accuracy needs to be above this certain threshold, or in cases where uh, it doesn't produce the right answer, it needs to do these other things and all this. And it just increases the complexity of defining the software, which means increases the complexity of defining the minimally viable product, which, by the way, I believe is the hardest thing for a product manager to do anyway, because, and you know, my theory is that there is all kinds of pressure from everybody to add more stuff to your MVP. A hundred percent. Well, and Always. to your product in, in, it's an infinite yeah. list of things that must be added or we will lose this next deal and our funding and our, our business will go bankrupt. And you are often alone. Uh, <laughs> as the product manager holding <laughs> back the tide yes because your customers want more features your yeah. executives want more features They're like wow 100 we're, we're, we're gonna put this in the market it's it's missing da, 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 da. even the developers who have to build the features often want more features because people want to build things you don't take a job to not build things and even product man Product managers want to, I want to build things. Like I don't take a job to not build things. I take a job to build things. And so yeah. the whole notion of stripping something down to its tiniest, most essential part is often just anathema to the entire mental process of everybody in the organization. Marketing, yes. sales, sales. Uh, do you remember the last time someone in sales says, ah, you know what? We don't need that feature. I'll sell it anyway. No, no. I, no, in fact, I, I. I, I, because I've spent my life in marketing and sales, it's more often it's been, oh, this customer will totally buy this next quarter if we just add these five things. And, yep. you know, those sometimes those things might be accurate, but sometimes they might not be. And they're not uh, quantifiable. They're not data driven decisions. They're yep. gut instinct. And that doesn't mm -hmm. get you anywhere for product development. And it's and it's a very this is so this is why I believe like this is the single most difficult thing. For any product manager, because yeah. you're fighting everyone, including yourself. Yes, your own and instinct. Ultimately, I'm going to make a, a huge blanket statement here. <laughs> and I don't know if people are, if, if anyone watching, you want to send me a note. Uh, I'm going to say right now, <laughs> I don't know who you are. I don't know what your product is. I don't know what your market is, but your MVP is too big. I agree with I you 100%. I, I was just going to ask you, you know, you're a mentor, you're an angel investor, you you work on all these different startup sort of uh, contests and things. You must run into this constantly. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do an MVP. And then you go, well, when will that be launched? Uh, maybe six months from now. <laughs> Like, yeah. Yeah. you're missing the point of an mvp it should be a web page with a buy now button <laughs> like there should be no product <laughs> so somebody uh i'm 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 uh posted a, a tweet and um i'm disappointed I, don't, I can't remember who it was so i can't attribute it to the person but uh, they said if you are not embarrassed by your mvp you launched too late <laughs> oh that is a great metric uh, yeah so uh, okay. Now on the, flip, on the flip side, you know, there is too early and there is not enough. And, but I think by kind of putting yourself in this mental frame where you're just trying to strip it down, I think is generally going in the right direction is because yeah. there's just so much uh, pressure to do more. If you can just try to tamp it down. Anyway, I don't think people fully, uh, appreciate the, the concept of landing and expanding either. 
So, right. and a lot of times, like the executive teams, the sales market, you know, if, if your MVP is small, it, it, may, it might only uh, satisfy a very small percentage of the market, which, by the way, is by design, right? You're trying to figure out your right. niche, right? And yeah. Um, uh, but the, I don't think people fully appreciate that from there you can grow. You can, right. you can expand the, uh, the pool of possible customers or possible markets by essentially taking that MVP and then iterating it in the marketplace and adding functionality and so forth. So, uh, right. and it's, you know, when you're looking for investment dollars, whether it be internal or external, you know, you're, I'm, the VCs, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it could often be the same conversation where, look, we want to, we want to raise around, right? So we need to, you know, we need to have a vision that's, that's, that's big. And if we have right. a product that's small, you know, that might be, that might work against us. And I think the complicating factor to kind of tie this back to AI, and I, I don't know this is true, uh, but I read something recently which said that X.AI, not to pick on them, but it was one of these booking services. You can use it to help you manage your calendar. And there was some question as to whether there was an AI in the back or just a bunch of people in a call center in the back or some combination between the two. Right. And I think that the general gist of the post was it might be okay if there are humans in there because they're probably helping train the system anyway. Uh, and so I think it just comes back to, you know, in terms of bringing this into the AI world, you may have to do a certain amount of training. You may have to have a certain amount of model development so you get good output and good predictions so that your product makes sense. But there's probably an MVP before that, which is a landing page or a series of landing pages or a marketing campaign to test whether this concept is something people would want in the first place. Bootstrapping your product with humans uh, to the extent that you can do that is, is not a terrible idea. All right. So why don't we uh, bring this kind of to a close? I think okay. what, what I've heard is, so product management as a discipline sounds like it's not, you know, there's not a lot of agreement on what that is. Uh, but if you're to take your position that it has two jobs to sort of assess the opportunity and then def from there define that product and, and communicate that down to the engineering and the production team to create that thing and do so in a way where you can stage it through these kind of MVPs. Um, and, and do all that while simultaneously evangelizing the heck out of it and not over promising and under delivering. <laughs> so it sounds like right. a terrible job and it's, it's a wonderful by the job. It's the of best AI. job. It's the best job. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it sounds like a great job. Uh, yeah, no, but it does sound very challenging and also really interesting. Where can people go if they are already a product manager and they want to move into this field or if maybe they, they don't even have this role and they go, man, I didn't know what a product manager did, but now that I do, I'm very interested in this space. Where would you point them? Yeah. And we'll put all the show notes in here as well, of course. Um, so there's so many resources on the internet. You know, some quick Google searches will find you, you know, just tons of stuff. Uh, so for people who are product managers and want to kind of focus on the AI aspects of it, I've written a few articles which are available on my LinkedIn page. So if I can just kind of promote that. Yeah, um, we can absolutely all link all that. Yep. You go check those out. Um, I think that... You know, there, there are not a lot of AI product management specific resources. Uh, I did hear that Udacity actually has a nano degree in product management for AI. Uh, so in, 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 I have an article which is quite long with tons of links about okay, great. Uh, different uh, emails, uh, newsletters that you can sign up for, uh, different uh uh, the websites that you can read, different courses that you can take. So, yeah, I think that uh, that could be a good place to start. If you're if you're an engineer in AI, you could probably go to product management for AI. Or if you work in AI and you want to go to product management for AI, you could probably do that. If you're not in either AI or product management, I would say if you can get into product management, perhaps not in AI first, do that for a bit, get the whole product management thing under your belt, and then migrate over to uh, in a second step to right. product management for AI, uh, that probably probably work the best. Excellent. Well, I think we uh, we sort of covered everything we were going to talk about today. So I just want to say thank you. I, this has been great. I think that this is the kind of information that 
is going to be critical to, I'm talking to a ton of AI focused startups. Uh, I will be sharing this information with them because I think that this just gives a really good sense of, hey, this is what your job is. This is what you should be doing. Yes, it's a hard task, but here's the, the totality of it. So I'm happy to share that with folks that I'm talking to. And I hope that some other folks who are out there who are looking at the space or in the space and yeah. want to focus on AI product management will uh, get some value out of it. Mark, I just want to say thank you for coming on today. This has been great and I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Troy. It has been an honor and a pleasure. I really, I really appreciate you inviting me. All right. I'll talk soon.